Hi guys, Mark Holfe here, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. I am so excited to be back again doing another EE Live Q&A. My practice has really transformed over the last year and a half. Who would have thought that by doing these live videos, that by just trying to help people, answering questions within the group, that it would actually result in a dramatic shift in how I practice immigration law, the kinds of clients that I take, the, the, the types of work that I do. And for years, my practice was dominated by business immigration. And it's still a very large part of what I do. But the individual work that I did, it just wasn't as much. I spent more time working with employers in Alberta, looking to source foreign workers and then transition them to permanent residents. And so that was a large part of my practice. But it has been absolutely unbelievable what has happened over the last little while. Um, every day I have more consults than I can fit in. And so they're starting to stretch out. But it is it is amazing the opportunity that I have to work with all of you guys now through Express Entry. And before, my practice was focused here in Alberta, a little bit global to some extent, um, with the global companies, I should say. But primarily, it was really domestic. Like most lawyers, you work with the people that live in your city. But it's all changed for me now. Now, I get to interact with you guys all over the world. I don't think there's too many countries left in the world that I haven't had an opportunity to, to have a paid consultation with that person. Skype, although it's a little bit archaic, is exactly how I communicate with my clients and it works awesome. And over time, I would always do the consult and then engage, the, cl the client would engage me to fully represent them. But I'll be honest, as things have transpired and as things have moved forward, I am actually doing more reviews of applications where you as the client actually maintain control over everything. I do it for half the price I usually charge a full representation for and you get direct interaction with me. I love it. It is so fun. It is so nice to just be able to chat and talk with people as we're putting the application together. My clients literally become friends. And so uh, this, if I could picture an ideal type of practice for Mark Holsey, this is exactly what it is. And I've got wonderful staff in my office that help me with all the other kinds of immigration. And um, it's, it's great. Now, with that being said, I've had a little bit of challenges in the office and I've had some very late nights. So in the last three days, I've had two of those three days working till about 3 a.m. to get clients' files out. But that was what I had to do because you guys have expectations of me and I wanted to take 10 days holiday with my family in Maui. So that's a reality and we work through it and uh, clients have been pretty patient with me and I've been able to manage surviving on only a couple hours sleep, but that's okay because I'm loving what I'm doing. So thanks to all of you who have connected with me, all my past clients, all of you who are in the process right now of booking consults with me, because this right here is something that Mark Holsey absolutely loves. And I hope you guys can sense it. All right, let's get to um, a few little housekeeping things. As always, guys, um, right here, the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself is the sponsor, if you will, of this. Because of all of the people that subscribe to that guide and benefit from it, it allows me to do this and all of the other times that I'll jump on and offer free advice. Now, many of you will be wondering, Mark, why don't you answer questions anymore? Why don't you respond to me? Well, understand that notwithstanding you're not getting an answer, I'm probably answering questions from a bunch of other people. It's just that there's so many people in the group that people just don't see them. And often I'm answering the same question over and over again. And so it just doesn't make, make sense from a, a, a precious time period, you know, when I have so many clients that are requiring my services that are paying clients. It's not very efficient for me to answer free questions, the same question to every individual person in the group. So that's why I created and started doing these EE Live Q&As to give you guys a chance to ask me the question in a way that I can amplify it to the whole world. And as you guys all know, I use my, and I'm gonna pull up a screen here. Um, I'm gonna show you what I use here. And those of you who are tuning in new, 
And those of you who are actually over watching a recording of this on my YouTube channel, you guys are awesome too. You may not be on Facebook, but that's okay. But if I flip over here and share my screen with you, all of the videos that I do are all stored here. And so when I post, when I do a video live, and we're up to like over 13,000 subscribers, which is really cool, all of the videos are all here. And you can see I, I post everything. There's tons of, of different testimonials from the guide that I just put out. Um, but all of my past e-live Q&As are all posted here. And, uh, and so don't ever forget about this. If you miss a video, it's here. And like I said, all of you awesome YouTube followers, I really appreciate all the comments and the feedback that you give me. It just motivates me to keep doing this. So very, very cool. And as you can see here, I have um, posted on the YouTube channel as well my special rate for complete reviews. And uh, I am going to try to get in some of my clients on to join us here at the beginning of our EE Live Q&A to share their experiences um, uh, actually going through this review process with me. I personally think it's pretty awesome and I don't know if any of my review clients are actually watching now but I'd love for you to post a comment. Um, while we're doing this I'm going to go into our group and make sure that I'm actually um, my audio is all good. I think it is and uh, you find people um, there we go. It's always challenging trying to talk and find my live feed. So and turn my volume down so nobody can hear it. Um, but I think it's all good, at least from past. Okay, let me know as always where you're tuning in from. So post which country. I love saying that. It's too bad the YouTubers can't see, um, or at least the, the followers of the YouTube channel can't see where everybody's tuning in from. That's why I actually explain it. You know, you guys that are live can see the comments from people, but I'm actually doing it for people that are um, who, who don't have access to it because they're not watching it live on Facebook. So uh, Priyank says, hey Mark, hi. Madhu says, you're doing a great job, sir, thanks. Um, Baba says hi, Baba, very good. Um, and I appreciate your comment. Baba left a very, very nice comment on um, just within our uh, Express Entry Law group about a consult that he had with me. And I, I appreciate that, my friend. That was very, very generous of you. Uh, Patricia says hi. Marwa says hi. Hi, Marwa, how are you? Another good, good client. Uh, Ashfakal, hi, Mark. Uh, Patricia, my application is ongoing and was wondering. Oh, okay, Patricia's already asking questions. Hang tight, Patricia. I will open it up for comments. And, um, and when I say post, then repost your comment. But don't do it before because I won't go back. All right. Um, okay. Skaponja ha says hi. Um, Miriam, blessings from Azerbaijan. Very cool. Uh, Imran's in the UAE. Danishwar is Pakistan, cool. Um, and then Ashfakal is asking questions. Hold those Ashfakal till the till I give you the green light to post. Uh, Madhu, uh, Madhu is from India and currently resides in Toronto. Cool, excellent. So not too late for you, Madhu. It's about two twelve there uh, in the afternoon. Um, and then uh, Rakshida is uh, Raj, very cool from India. So we've got a great group. We've got Abdullah as well from Lahore. Abdullah, awesome. Great to connect with you and I look forward to working with you as well, Abdullah. All right, so we've done the introductions, which is, which is great. And um, I just want to, um, uh, let's see here, uh, just remind everybody and I'll just post this and see if I can get this to work properly. Yes. So remember for those of you who are watching, there's a couple things that I want you to remember if it's the first time that you've been watching these videos. One is that I try to do them at noon every Tuesday, Mountain Standard Time, um, right here on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. And two, if you want me to answer your question via email, which I've got a bunch right here. You can do that by sending me an email to mholthy at stringham.ca and it's right here in the little image and always put EE live Q&A exactly in the subject line because if you choose not to do that, um, more than likely I'm going to send it to my new assistant Stephanie and ask her to book a consultation for uh, with you. And some people that's exactly why they're they're sending me um, emails is because they want to set that process in motion and they just need a little extra help. And so um, that's the direction that I will send you. All right. 
we have covered off the housekeeping stuff, which is great. So let's dive into our questions. And um, I have a few really good ones today. And I'm going to grab my pen. There it is. Got my pen. Hmm. And my water, <laughs> which is uh, going to be pretty important too. All right. So the first question is from Bilal. And uh, Bilal says, um, this is Bilal Khan from Pakistan. I've done four years of electrical engineering. I've got one and a half years. And actually, I better make a note here of when I started talking here so I can timestamp these. Um, my question is, he says, I've got one and a half years of experience as a trainee, as a trainee engineer in the cement industry. So um, he says, my question is, do trainee engineers count as professional experience? And this, my friend, is a great question. Excuse me. And one I don't think that I've really addressed before in detail. So kudos to you for bringing some awesome new content. Well, I want to jump back and I'm going to share my screen with you guys again. And I'm going to go right to the Federal Skilled Worker Program elig eligibility. There it is. And I'm going to pull up this awesome little site right here. And what I'm going to show you now is uh, something that you have to, that I want you to focus on. And this is what it takes to claim your skilled work experience. So what exactly do you have to prove? So if you are a trainee engineer, a trainee accountant, a trainee professional in whatever designation, which NOC code do you use? Well, let's go through here and I just want to point out right from the bat, and I'm not going to go right to the regulations, but we'll use the policy that's on the government website to teach us. So right off the bat, in order to qualify, um, you have to meet all these expectations, but you can see right here, right at the beginning, skilled work experience. Obviously, it has to be, you have to identify the four digit code in the NOC, and the NOC 2016 is the one that we commonly use now. It has to be a managerial, professional, or technical job or skilled trade. So zero A and B. Then this is the part here. And I'll qualify a little bit of these instructions. It says you must show that you worked in your primary occupation. Um, your duties performed right here must be uh, all of the activities in the lead statement and we're going to take a look at this in just a second. And then um, it also includes all essential duties and most of the main duties. So when I see most, most means in the regulations for immigration, a substantial number. So this is where the government is trying to make it a little bit easier for people to understand because most is easier to understand than substantial. Well, the way I look at express entry these days, if you don't know the difference between substantial and most, or how most is another word for substantial, then you're probably not going to qualify for express entry because you need to be super, super um, high level of, of English in order to get through. And you guys all know that. So let's take a look here and let's take the example and I'll use, um, I'll use Bilal's example here and we'll go 2016 as the source for this little tutorial. So if we go here, we're just going to punch in engineer. And I don't know exactly. Oh, he said electrical engineer. Let's do that. Electrical, electrical engineer. Okay. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Boy, oh, I'm trying to type too fast. I can spell. I can. <laughs> just not fast. Okay. So if we go here, electrical and electronics engineers, we'll open this one up. So this is the one that Bilal is actually using. And so his question is, I worked as a trainee. And so the first thing that I always want to point out is it doesn't matter what your title is. The only thing that's important is right here that you have performed all of the essential duties and most of the main duties as well as the duties in the lead statement. So what's the lead statement? Well, it's written right here. You can't go wrong. So whether you're a trainee or whether you're a full-fledged engineer, we don't care about these things right here, employment requirements. These employment requirements to fill the position are only for Canada. They're only for coming to work in Canada. They're not for the purposes of assessing your foreign work experience uh, for the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the Canadian Experience class for that matter. But in all honesty, if it was the CEC, you probably need these because you're already going to be in Canada. So we'll restrict it to the Federal Skilled Worker Program. But these employment requirements, which are listed on all of the, the, the descriptions, uh, the, the profile descriptions in the NOC, the National Occupational Classification System, 
So each of these, you can pre pretty much toss them out the door. So what does that mean? Well, a full-fledged license isn't required. It's actually what your duties are. So for Bilal, did he perform all the duties in the lead statement here? And then we're looking at a substantial number of these main duties right here. So that's where you're going to do the assessment. Now you'll see here in the instructions, many people are wondering, well, it says includes all essential duties. Well, what are essential duties? Well, if we look here on the electrical and electronics, you'll see here that there are all, all of these duties are like there's no qualifiers. So all of the do all of these duties are the ones to that you actually have to perform. And so when I think of substantial, what does that mean? Well, it's about 75%. That's average. It could be more, it could be less, but that's a general guideline. So that you've performed a substantial number of these main duties. And how do you determine that? You look at your reference letter. That's what the officers are going to look at. They're going to compare your reference letter with the duties in the NOC to see if there's alignment. And then from there, they're going to base their determination as to whether or not they feel you have met these requirements for the purposes of your federal skilled worker program eligibility. Okay. And so what I'm going to jump over here, I'm going to pull this up. I want to show you the difference. Let's go knock 2016. And I think if I open this up and just choose a very common one, like many of you find folks out there, if I pick a software engineer and we open this up, we can go software engineers and designers. Let's take a look at these duties and I'll show you what I mean. So the difference between this for a software engineer, if you go down here, you can see right here, it says may lead and coordinate a team. I know because I just reviewed this with a client yesterday, but I do tons of IT work. So may lead means that this duty right here is not really part of the equation that I calculate. So if I'm trying to find 75% of the duties, I'm going to base that on these one, two, three, four, five duties. And I basically omit that. So what's about 75% of those five duties? Well, maybe, maybe it's four, right? But um, ultimately this one here is not a mandatory because it has the may in front of it. So that is how I demystify the crazy world of express entry. And that's how I determine what is considered to be an essential duty. The ones that have no qualifier, no may, I see, I, I determine those as being essential. And the ones that are may are not. So there you have it. Fantastic question, Bilal. And I may just make that the key the key one, I know right now I've got what happens if you pay cash, I think is the headline, which is one of the questions coming up. But excellent question. Thank you so much. All right. So now let's jump back to the next question. And this one is from Ahmed. And Ahmed says, uh, hello, Mr. Mark. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your advice and informative videos. I could not find any better and detailed information in any other videos or website. Well, that's great. Guess why? Because I'm giving everything away for free. I'm not holding anything back. And people are thinking, Mark, are you crazy? Like most of my colleagues and everyone else uh, thinks that I'm crazy for basically giving everything away that I know, all my knowledge, all my experience. But when I look at my practice, and I look at how many people are booking consults with me and are retaining me to review their applications and represent them fully. Well, why? Why do I do that? It's because I want you to know that I know what I'm doing. And people who want the peace of mind, they could probably fill it out themselves, but some people don't have the time or just don't want to be bothered or just want that extra set of eyes that they can trust to look at their application and determine if they've missed anything. Because you guys all know, rejections happen for the smallest, slightest, inconsequential reason. You forgot a, a, you know, a state certificate or traffic report from Queensland or Victoria in Australia or you uploaded a black and white copy of a translated police certificate from Germany, or you failed to include a police certificate um, from a country that you didn't even think about, you totally forgot about, and it gets returned. And so the benefit of having someone that you trust look at your application uh, and that second set of eyes is that you can catch those little things that cause unbelievable harm. And if you're sitting at 475 points, you are 30 years old, you know, you're probably not going to be harmed too bad if your application gets returned. 
Well, I say that because there's a lot of other factors. Maybe you're an H-1B in the US. Your time is running out. You don't have time and you don't want to have to go all the way back to India and relocate, you know, and resettle yourself and then try to immigrate to Canada. You just want to come straight across from the US because the US basically is is not providing any help to any H-1B holders from India. I think you guys are probably at about 150 years to get your application processed, which basically means no one is going through. You will all be dead. <laughs> and so fortunately for you, you have Canada and Express Entry, which is the golden opportunity for you because you're the ideal candidate in many respects for people who are looking to immigrate to Canada through the general stream without a connection to a province or work or study. So keep that in mind. All right. So as we go through these questions here, um, uh, yeah, that's why I do what I do. So let's jump back to Ahmed and look at his specific question. So regarding the EE live session, I have a question that you might find interesting. Okay. I'm 21 years old and I study film and I work at the same time as a freelance filmmaker and independent film director. Wow. Do you know what, Ahmed? I need you to come here and film me and make a movie on me writing the IELTS test. Now, that would be a lot of fun. I've actually really wanted to do that um, and give my and document my experience writing that test as a Canadian immigration lawyer. And I think there's no restrictions on me doing it. But um, I know it's grueling and it would be very curious to see what results I get back. Now, hopefully I'd be able to score high and everything. But the way you guys describe it, who knows? I'm not perfect. That would be a movie. We could all oh, we could have fun with that, Ahmed. All right. So the independent filmmaker, director Ahmed here, he says he's been working for three years and he will graduate soon and apply for EE, hopefully. So what does that mean, guys? It means that Ahmed is going to school and working full time or part time, whatever time he's equating. But remember, remember. That is 100% okay and fine outside of Canada. It's just in Canada when you're on a study permit that you can't often claim that work experience. Okay? All right. So now to his direct question. Ahmed says, um, my question is in, uh, is in my reference letter. It's stating that I was working long distance, so basically virtually, but full time. And the type of payment was cash and other benefits like funding my films and university studies. Will that be a problem when it comes to work experience checks? As my employer used to pay me by cash for each project I do. So in all honesty, this all boils down to proving your work experience, right? That's what it comes down to. And so if we go back to the very core essentials, and once again, I am going to, it's important for everybody to understand this. I'm going to go to the completeness check here for IRCC and I'm going to pull up work experience right here. And in this section, we're going to go right to the essential core. So Ahmed here has talked about doing freelance work and I'll get to that. But essentially, what is required? What do you have to prove? Well, this is mandatory for work, each work experience declared. That mandatory is there for a reason. So what's, what's important? Well, obviously, you need the reference letter or experience letter from the employer. That's what they want. It says here that they want it on company letterhead. So if it's not, well, you're running the risk an officer may not accept it. Um, it needs to have the contact information for the, for the person that is, is actually signing off on the letter. So if immigration wanted to reach out to them, they could. But it also needs, of course, to have your name. And, it, and then we get into all of the positions that you've held with the company. When I have multiple positions, I'll include them all in the same letter and then I will break them out in my express entry application as separate work sections, especially if you're moving between knock codes. And then I upload the same letter in each of those sections in my personalized document checklist. That's how I deal with that. You may deal with it differently, but that's how I do it. Then the most important thing right here, and I'm gonna take some time to enlarge my screen Hopefully I haven't lost where I was looking here so that everybody can see this very clearly because I know some of you are looking, watching on your handheld. These are the core elements that you need in your reference letter. And why do you have those? Because those are actually the core elements that you need to prove right here. And I'll shrink this back down that you need to prove to, to get your skilled work experience accepted for the purposes of the Federal Skilled Worker Program 
which is the eligibility program for express entry. And so you need to be able to prove each of these things here. And how do you do that? Well, the government has given you instructions. You use it through, and I'll hit that a couple times, you use it by way of your reference letter from your employer. That's how you prove. So job title, obvious. Duties and responsibilities, which is often missed from letters. So that job title, duties and responsibilities, job status, are you currently working there or is it, was it a past one? Which then leads into the dates worked for the company. Maybe you worked for them and left and then went back. I've had clients who've done that. And then the number of work hours per week, which is often missing. And finally, and this comes down to the cash question that Ahmed has asked and many of you ask that same question, annual salary plus benefits. I interpret all of this stuff literally, guys. If I have an ability to go back to my employer and say, hey, you listed my wage as an hourly wage um, versus an annual salary, could you change it? I will actually go back and have them change it. Now, many people will say, Mark, you're crazy. Why are you doing this? It's because express entry is crazy. The officers have no mercy. They are ruthless. Sometimes they're downright cruel and heartless. Um, I better be careful. I don't want to slag them too much because that's just how the program is designed. It's not their fault. Um, the officers are just following the, the directions that they've been given from NHQ in Ottawa as to how to process the applications with six months service level standards. Um, they have to be efficient and they don't have time to hold applications and ask you to update or fix something that's wrong in your application. If you get it wrong, everybody, well, understand you are pretty much, what's the word? Um, I have to think of something professional here. Um, screwed, <laughs> pretty much. Your application's getting returned. So I am meticulous. And those who have sat with me and done a silver plan, and actually I just connected with someone through Messenger who had trouble with their consultant, and I won't name the, the named consultant, who weren't moving fast enough. So they're just gonna engage me to do the review. And I said to them, look, I understand the urgency, I understand you're in a crunch, so I'll, I'll stay late. I'll work late Wednesday, tomorrow night to, to make it work for you. And that's how I roll, guys. So, but those who have attended the, the and engaged my silver plan, I call it, the, the, and actually the silver plan is almost like a platinum plan. I love it more than my gold even. Um, when I do that with people, it takes us hours because I go through everything with them. And we talk and visit a little bit too, but we go through everything to make sure that it is 100% correct. And that takes time. So I'm meticulous. But when it comes to this whole issue of cash, which once again is the question we're talking about here, annual salary plus benefits, you need to prove that. So how do you prove it? That you were paid. And if we go back to the eligibility, right at the top here, you will see here, this bullet point in the Federal Skilled Worker Program Eligibility, paid work. So not volunteer or unpaid internships. They don't count. So how do you prove it? So you have to use your creative, creative mind. Now, obviously, when you're providing this information to support your, um, your work experience, so proof of work experience, you can see that it just asks for you to provide the letter. When you go into the personalized document checklist, it often says to provide also pay stubs if available. Why? Because some people might be paid in cash. Maybe that cash payment, um, you have pay stubs from your company, but they just, that's how they pay. Some people pay via check and then you go take it to your bank and deposit it. Some people pay via direct deposit from the company's account to your bank account. There's a whole host of different ways. So how else do you prove? Well, in your case, Ahmed, you've got different remittances. So you, I should say you've got different remuneration. Sometimes they give you, you know, bonuses or benefits um, that flow from working. Now, usually we're looking for a monetary amount. So an exchange of say, I'll help you do this video if you help pay for my school. Well, the payment needs to be tracked and documented as being income. How an officer actually treats that will really just be up to them. They have discretion and it's no two officers are the same. But receiving compensation is the key that you're not doing it for free. Then it's up to you to be creative to show that actually you did receive that money. And for you, Ahmed, who's sitting right on three years, which is the absolute minimum 
amount of foreign work experience to really maximize your comprehensive ranking system score, um, you're going to need to be creative. And obviously, if you're in filmmaking, you've got a creative side to what you do. So did you, did you, how did you deposit the cash? Um, is there some other record? Do you have, um, you know, maybe even the beginning, maybe an appointment letter or an offer letter? Or yeah, like I said, if it's the freelance work you're doing, did you have some kind of a written agreement? Um, did you issue invoices to the company and then they paid them based on the work when it was completed? So it all comes down to how you prove it via paper or electronic documents that you upload. And everybody's different. There is no one way of doing it. The last thing I'll finish off here, and these explanations are quite a bit longer. I should probably cut them out and use them as separate little segments and repost them. But for now, we'll leave it as it is. Self-employed, here's some instructions here, right below on this completeness check website. And it just talks about you need to prove, like if you're incorporated, that you actually have a business and that there's evidence that you own that business then evidence of self-employment income. And that's what we talked about. If you're paid cash, then you need to be able to document or prove it. Um, and then the companies that you worked for, whoever you did, you worked for to, to actually produce the films, um, they then will often provide co confirmation that you've done the work that they've asked you and um, that you provided a service and you were paid for it. But remember, self-declared affidavits, in this case, do nothing. Lots of people will do them for the purposes of name changes and things like that. But for proving self-employed work experience, yeah, it's not going to work. Okay, awesome. Great question. That was that created just a wonderful opportunity for me to address that whole issue of cash. Okay, next on our list, uh, this one is from Mustafa. And we'll get the timing down here. Mustafa says, uh, my name is Mustafa. My CRS score is 450. That's awesome. 450 is right in the range where you're going to get drawn. Uh, my question relates to the reference letter. My company is ready to provide it to me, but without the job description. Okay, so this is very, very similar to the question we just answered for, um, uh, for Ahmed. And uh, Mustafa's question is a reference letter that's incomplete, that doesn't have the duties in it. And, uh, and so um, he says here... Uh, I was wondering if I can include the reference letter without the job description. So short answer is yes, you're going to give them everything that you've got, no matter how deficient it, no matter how deficient it is. Sometimes the reference letters are going to be just bare bones. You know, Mustafa worked this date, this date, this was his employment. This is, you know, um, and uh, he ended on this day and, you know, and that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing more than that. And so you have to take whatever they give you. Um, and then he says, can I use that and then include a letter by my colleague attested, I'm assuming like a sworn statement, I swear this is true, in which I have all my job duties that match the knock. I might also add current month's pay slips to my documents. Is that enough for employment proof? So absolutely, if you've got pay stubs, include them. There's no harm in doing it. If you've got a colleague, I often like supervisors or people that you report to to do those attestation letters or those affidavits, they're better. But if you're looking at the importance and level of importance, then obviously a current employee who's still working with the company who provides a sworn affidavit to support you, um, that works. Does your company have in your original offer letter, did it describe your duties? Do they advertise for the position online or do, uh, through some advertising where they actually list the job description that you are currently or are claiming points for? All of those are possibilities and the lists are endless, far too much to address just in a Facebook live video like I'm doing right here. But Mustafa, if you need any assistance and you're trying to sort out all the best ways, um, I, I do this probably. It forms a large part of many, many of my consults that I do. So you can go on the, the link um, that for my firm, which is usually included in everything, the description for this video, for instance, and on the Facebook um, page as well. And if some of you of my viewers are um, so kind as to provide the link there for Mustafa, you guys are often super generous when you're listening. Um, just post that link in the comment section below. So we're all one team here getting these videos pushed out. All right. The last one is from uh, Stella. And so I'll write the time here. Stella's question is, I just binged watched your YouTube videos and they are so helpful. That's awesome. Can you imagine how much time that Stella, if she was binge watching, I wonder if I could get it up on Netflix, do you think? Maybe, 
<laughs> maybe Netflix, Netflix could do a, a, a professional um, self-help series on immigrating to Canada and they could run my videos as, uh, as, as self-help. That would be hilarious. That is so funny. So let's see, I think I actually lost it again. So if we go back here to my YouTube channel and I, I just put this into context here. Um, okay, so if I go here and then go to my videos and Stella says that she has been binge watching them. Look at this guys, like as far as binge watching, you know, how far back do you have to go? I don't even know how long ago, but still going. Wow. And going, well, I'll stop it there anyways. But you guys can see I have done so many videos. And um, yeah, it's it's just been so much fun. Okay, so back on track. Let's get back here to Stella's actual question. So here's what she asks. She says, I've been self-employed. Okay, as a freelance transcriber with a certain company since mid-2017. So she's got a year. Um, they, however, declined to give me a reference letter. How unsurprising. Um, I have the email of the correspondence when I ask them. I have proof of payments via PayPal. I have lots of emails of communication with them, one of which is a promotion, as well as screenshots of my work logs on their website. Would these be enough proof of self-employment? Stella, include every single thing that you've talked about. There is no limit to what you, what you can include. And your ability to prove self-employed work experience um, is not restrained or restricted by anything other than your own creativity. So when it comes to proving work experience as a self-employed individual, um, there are no holds barred. Literally, you have the ability to include whatever you like. And you don't have nice, clean reference letters with pay stubs. And immigration can be very, very tough when it comes to accepting self-employed work experience. So we talked about a lot of different things in the past question that was answered. But ultimately, the onus is on you to prove it. And the onus is on you to prove each of those things that we talked about. If I flip back here to the page, within this, each of these same things that are typically included in your reference letter from the employer. So this is the reference letter, experience letter from the employer. And you remember right here, it needs to include all of these things, job duties, res title, responsibilities, hours worked. And where does that come from? It comes right here from the Federal Skilled Worker Eligibility section for skilled work experience. Just because you're self-employed doesn't mean you don't have to still meet each of these requirements showing that you know it's within the last 10 years, that it's paid, that it's at least one year of continuous 1,560 total hours. And Stella, that sometimes is the real challenge showing that your work was actually continuous. Because if it wasn't, and you need at least one year of continuous, once you've got that one year covered, then you have the ability to kind of patchwork other work experience as long as it has all of the other elements but for continuous. All right, so hopefully that answered your question. These were really good questions today, and it really gave me an opportunity to really teach, which I truly love. So now, guys, now is the time. Now's the time for you guys to start posting your questions in the comments below, and I will start answering them. So if I go to the last one, um, we'll start with Patricia. So Patricia's question is, I would like to know what effect, if any, will the new funds requirement have on ongoing applications? Well, Patricia, I can tell you that everything is locked in once you file your EAPR. Um, so when it comes time to proving funds, um, that funds is locked in once you've filed your EAPR and they've done the initial completeness check. And then after that, like the other areas, it's the same situation. You are, you know, you're going to, um, there's Bella joined. Hey, Bella, how are you? Um, you, you, um, I'm just going to go back to your question here because there was like 5,000 that are all being posted now. Oh my goodness, crazy. <laughs> Let's see if I can find your question again. Uh, there it is. Okay. It, it just, my, the feed just keeps scrolling, so it makes it tough. So if you have the ability to top up your account or to add the, you know, three, four hundred extra dollars that you might have to add now that the proof of funds total has, has increased, then, um, then I just counsel my clients to do that. Just add it on. But it's not like when you originally filed and provided that evidence to immigration that now they're going to refuse your application because now the, pro, the the funds have gone up. No. If you're at the ITA stage and you haven't filed your EAPR yet, then yeah, 
if you missed it and and you know and, and sorry if you caught it then you absolutely have to show that you've got those funds now it says average balance for six months well if you're right on that cusp and you just had enough they're not going to be too too worried if you then add a little bit more right before you file your EAPR to get it up to that level. Because ultimately, you were maintaining what they wanted for the previous six months. And with only two months between filing, getting your ITA and submitting your EAPR, there's no opportunity to, to, to show six months average balance. And understand that average balance is not a mandatory requirement. So it's not that you have to have an average balance above that amount. Um, you know, over the past six months, you just have to have that balance in your account at the time in which you um, in which you actually submit your EAPR. Okay, so there's the question. Good one, Patricia. That was a good one. I like that one. You know what? I'm going to see if I can keep track of these as date stamps. Um, unless Bella, you have nothing else to do, my friend, and you want to date stamp these, I'm going to try to remember Patricia proof of funds, and that was that question was asked right around the 40 minute mark okay all right next question this one is from uh madhu and madhu says i started my okay let's see oh madhu you've got a big journal here okay started my job january 2018 and i've completed my one year by january 2019 and i still have one more year job mentioned in offer letter till february 2020 same as mentioned in my work permit i've claimed my job offer 50 points by the time i submit i have one year job offer submitted one week back but do not know how many days it would take to complete my application let's say if they take four months to process means after four months my job still exists for eight months as cic took months and in cic website they mentioned at least one year after they should perm resident visa if this is the scenario what kind of decision will officer take <laughs> madhu oh my goodness that question is all over the place the reality is you only get credit for the work experience that you've actually worked not what your work permit is valid for, what's in the future. You get credit for the work experience that you had up to the point in which you submit your EAPR. It gets locked in. So you're going to put continuous when you're recording that work history, um, that particular employment, but you're not getting credit for work to 2020. You're only getting credit for the work that you actually have completed. So, and that's on the day that you file your EAPR. Um, that's basically where it's locked in. So, um, interesting question. But uh, hopefully that one answered it for you. Okay. Uh, Zareen says, um, hey, Mark, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, knock change after ITA. Okay. Do we need a letter of explanation? So you're going from 6314 to 6212. This is a good one. I'll put Zareen here. And then I will, um, the time is about 4220. So this is a change in knock is what she's asking. So Zareen, basically, um, she says, do we need to give the letter of explanation? Of course you do. If yes, what should we write exactly? Well, I can't tell you exactly what to write because that, like that type of specific direction and legal advice, I'd only be able to do by looking at your whole application. So Zareen, you need to book a consult with me. Um, but the reason for changing was I figured the new one matches more. My 60 days for knock submission ends in two weeks. Okay, well, Zareen, if you want to, like there's a bunch of things we have to talk about in your situation. You know, what was your CRS score? Like what is the ramifications of declining and resubmitting your, your profile to get a new ITA? Was it high enough to do that? Often I'll do that if it's not a big deal. Two weeks, three weeks later, you've got another ITA and you've already got everything ready to be submitted. So I'll often decline. Um, the ITA in those circumstances. However, you say you've got to get it done. Uh, 60 days is ending in two weeks. Um, if you want, uh, you know, if you want specific direction and guidance, you can book a consult with me and I can walk you through that. But ultimately, the key is there's two factors that you have to take into consideration. One is um, that change, an officer at any point can say, look, this just isn't, you know, the, the, the difference between the two, they're like two different positions and and I'm, I'm not going to accept that request to, you know, that, that alteration. But generally speaking, knock changes are not going to be a big deal um, as long as all of the other conditions are met. So you continue to meet the minimum entry criteria for the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the CEC. And it doesn't impact in any way your comprehensive ranking score, which of course it wouldn't. You're going from a skilled occupation, 6314, to a skilled occupation, 6221. But in terms of what to write in your letter of explanation, 
that's something I can't advise here. All right. Okay, Sonia says, okay, knock 0124. Um, so this is Sonia, and that is at 4441. Okay, Sonia says, knock 0124 has multiple titles and each having individual duties. But the heading says, manager in this unit group performs some or all of the following duties. I being e-business manager. Oh, yeah. Marketing manager. There's a bunch of different ones on that one. Do I need to perform duties under other titles as well or just under my title and ignore the others? Simple answer, just your title and ignore the others. So, and you'll look for, for one of the reasons e-business manager is so popular when people are coming into Canada is that you don't need to have an actual marketing degree to fill the position. It's the only one on that particular knock. Whereas if you're a marketing manager, it says that you actually as a mandatory requirement to come and work in Canada. You, you, you know, if you're working on a labor market impact assessment based work permit, you need to show that you've got a marketing degree or a related, uh, related educational credential. So that's a very, very popular one, the e-business manager. But the world is changing too. And that tends to be, by and large, a real, real growth area in terms of employment. Companies looking to market online. Okay. All right. Next question. This one's from Anatolius. Um, and Anatolius says, I read somewhere that if an applicant is divorced, the immigration officer can reject his application for permanent residence based on this fact. Oh my goodness. Anatolius, could you please provide us all with the source of that information? And the reason I want you to do that is so that we can all collectively laugh at the person who actually made that statement. Because it is as our, well, let's see. What's the good word? Hmm. Ludicrous. Look that one up. That's ludicrous to think that being divorced is going to cause your application to be rejected. Nope. <laughs> but that's quite funny, actually. I like that one. That's really funny. I'm going to actually put this down here because it's so funny that I'm, people would probably actually want to go jump from the YouTube video right to this spot to hear the answer to that one. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Okay, Aryan says, Hi, Mark. I'm applying as an accompanying spouse, but was married before as well, but divorced my first wife, then later my current wife, then later married my current wife. Now my questions in my divorce certificate does not have a passport number for my first wife. As I didn't have it back then, will that be a problem? No, it will not in any way, shape or form. The reality is, Arian, uh, and I'm not even sure if I can, how I would even qualify or, or describe this particular question for listeners, but the reality is there's lots of nuances in other countries. For example, in India, it's very customary to have your parents' names in your passport. Um, well, many other countries, that's not the case. So there's a lot of local domestic internal to your country requirements or expectations or things like that, where for Canada, we just don't care. It's not relevant. So my divorce certificate does not have a passport number for my first wife. We don't care. As long as it's got the name and the name matches what would be in maybe her passport, although you don't have to include it, that's not going to be an issue. So that is, um, that's a good question though, because it applies to a lot of different things. Like, oh, the name in my passport um, of my mother, which, oh boy, you, you folks from India, I've never seen a country that has so many errors with names and how they're spelled and last names missing and you know, initials used instead of first name. So there's so many internal domestic customary practices. Um, so there'll be errors sometimes on a, a passport, for instance, the name of, of one of the parents, the last name is missing or something like that. Well, in all of those cases, we, we just have to explain. And usually officers understand India, they understand the nuances. And as long as it makes sense and they don't have a reason to doubt, well, then you're not going to have an issue. But me and my clients, when I do the silver plan, I actually sit down with them together and we write the letter of explanations together. It's actually quite fun. I really enjoy it. And that's one that I answer probably explain more than any others. Okay. Ahmed here says, hello, Mark. Thank you for your help. Um, I have a reference letter and it was stated that I was working long distance from home and it was stated I was paid by cash. Uh, let's see. I think, did I answer? I think I, did I answer Ahmed? I'm not sure if I answered your question. If it was yours that I already did. And maybe you're late coming to the podcast or a podcast. I just did another episode. Um, no, 
you're new. <laughs> there's a lot of Ahmeds, just like there's a lot of Michael Smiths and David Williams in Canada. There's a lot of Ahmeds, so I get confused. All right, so reference letter, long distance, paid by cash. Oh, maybe I already answered it here in the video feed. That's why. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's been a long day. Um, okay, so he says, also it was stated that I worked two knocks at the same time, film director and cinematographer. Will that be a problem? Will that be problematic? Yeah, you have to have one. And you need to show that you've performed a substantial number of those main duties as that one knock. You can't have duplicate knocks. And so in your case, maybe those two different knocks are going to only amount to part-time work because the duties were split 50-50. And remember, 15 hours per week at a minimum is part-time. 30 hours a week at a minimum is full-time. It's pretty hard to show, although it's not impossible, that you actually worked full-time for two companies at the same time. But your situation, Ahmed, yeah, it's, it's not easy. You have to meet the minimum entry criteria for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, having one year of continuous full-time work experience, 1,560 hours in that year. And that can be split up into two part-time positions where that 1,560 hours is established over two years with a minimum of 15 hours per week. So hope that helps, Ahmed. Okay, um, that's actually a good question, Ahmed. I'm going to uh, see if I can guess that timestamp. Maybe that started about 50. Okay, um, do, do, do. Okay, next one is Yash. Okay, hello, Mark Holthy. Hello, Yash Yoshi. How are you, my friend? Um, I'm in the US and I've worked for three employers in the last 11 months. Wow. In between, I had almost one month break due to delay of my start date for the next project. I will complete one year of experience in February and planning to apply for express entry in March. I don't have continuous experience with just one employer. Will that cause a problem? Well, the key here is that, um, well, let's take a look. Look at, the, look at the expectations, okay? So it says here, skilled work experience must be in the same type of job, have the same knock, okay? As the job you use, the, the, the job you want to use for immigration application. So that's your primary occupation. So it has to be the same knock. That's the starting point with your work experience. It has to be within the last 10 years. It has to be paid. It has to be at least one year of continuous work or 1,560 hours, total of 30 hours per week. And that one month break that you have between projects, I, I don't think it's going to work. I honestly think that they probably would find you that you don't have that right there. But in terms of working for multiple employers, um, it says you can meet this in a few different ways. Full time at one job, equal amounts in part time, or full-time at more than one job. So the first one is you're working straight through for the same company. The second one is <clears throat> you're working for basically 24 months with the same company, but just part-time. And the third option they give is full-time at more than one job, 30 hours per week for 12 months or more. So the key is that it's continuous right here. And I think that's where you don't have. So you're actually missing that part. And it says here for part-time work, you can work more or less than 15 hours a week as long as it adds up to 1,560 hours, which is a new addition, guys. This is a new statement here. So for part-time work, you can work more or less than 15 hours per week as long as it adds up to 1,560 hours. And that would be over the course of 24 months, okay? Um, and so we don't count any hours above 30. They don't, they're not irrelevant, but I wanna to flip to the bottom here and I'll show you something. Look at the bottom here. This was last updated August the 29th, 2018. So, fairly recently. All right, good question. Let's jump to our next one here. And we're just about at the end of our pod, uh, uh, I keep saying podcast. We're just about at the end right now. Okay, let's see if we can figure out where we left off. Uh, it's all a blur. Abdi, how are you, my friend? Abdi's watching again. Good to see that you are here. Your work permit should be on the way, my friend. Okay. Um, uh, let's see if I can figure out. Oh, so many came through that I, I lost my spot. Um, okay. So next one here is, uh, actually it was Abdi. Patricia says, thanks from Kenya. You're very welcome, Patricia. Okay, Danishwar says, hello, sir. I am a secondary school teacher. 
Very cool. I was a secondary school teacher myself in a previous life. Um, I was paid cash. Will it be required to prove the cash in this case or the reference letter will be okay? Okay, Danishwar, I spent a whack of time talking all about cash and I think you may have joined a little bit late. Um, the cash one was at Da, 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 um, 1750. So the 1750 mark, Danishwar, I want you to watch that response because I, I address that directly. Okay. Um, Madhu says he has been seconded to so and so company on. Okay. Uh, okay. So understand, Madhu you have to have a labor market impact assessment. So Madhu's question here relates to job offers and what constitutes a job offer. Um, Madhu, there's only three ways that you can get a job offer. The company who is giving it to you is, um, it is actually um, uh, has obtained a labor market impact assessment for you or to support your permanent residence or two, the labor market impact assessment that they have supports a work permit for you to come and work while you're waiting for your PR to be completed. Or if you're being seconded, that suggests an intercompany transfer. And the only way you're getting job offer points, if it truly is an intercompany transfer into Canada and you're actually got a, a work permit, is if you work or show that you've worked for the company for a year. And then at that stage, you're, you're then eligible. So then you ask, well, is that wording seconded good enough? Well, for you, my friend, I'm going to go back here and we're going to go right back. And this time we're going to search for, we're going to search for offer, offer of employment. So the letter of offer from the employer is exactly this. And we don't talk a lot about this because most of you guys are not in Canada, but this is what the letter is supposed to look like for the employer. And this is to confirm that the applicant's qualifying offer of arranged employment. And if I was to click on here, oh, look at this. It's actually, the link is broken. I'll find that and I'll post it in the comments. But the qualifying offer is just what I explained. LMIA to support P PR, which I call a PLMIA. LMIA supported work permit. You're working in Canada or an LMIA exempt, but it's a named employer on the work permit and you've worked one year. Okay, so only... Okay, so this document is required only if the applicant claims to have a qualifying offer of arranged employment. And that's the th one of the three options. Uh, the letter from the employer offering must include all of these things. And so you can see here, expected start date, um, that the applicant will be employed on a continuous, sound familiar guys, paid, yes it does sound familiar, full time, and what's full time? 30 hours per week at a minimum, for work that is for at least one year, after issuance of permanent resident visa. In addition, it has to provide the job title, duties and responsibilities. If the person is currently working with the company and that happens, then the current job status, number of hours worked per week and annual salary and benefits. So, and then if there is an associated LMIA to the offer of employment, the LMIA number is requested as part of the application. So you don't have to scan in your copy of the LMIA with your job offer. Sometimes people do, sometimes they don't. All right, great question. All right, guys, we've got a couple more minutes here and then our time is up. Let's see what we have next here. The next question is, uh, <laughs> uh, you guys are funny. Okay, the next question is, um, I think uh, maybe jo Joss. Hi, Mark, I've heard of a couple of cases where an ADR is given for IMM forms, yeah? Is it advisable to give an IMM form up front? Um, example, my siblings and their family are PR holders and I'm worried that they will ask for IMM 5406 and that will delay my application. Joss, you can't, you can't, it's really hard to anticipate and I don't think anything's gained by providing that because understand those questions are basically the same ones by and large that are included in your, um, your EAPR. Why do they ask those questions? Well, often they ask for people to provide new background declaration forms or other things for one simple reason. They think you've missed something or they, there's some inconsistency in how you answered your questions in your EAPR. That's why they come back and ask. So is there conflicting information on your travel history? You know, does it not match with your address history? Does your work history not match with where you say you actually lived? And so all of those things can trigger the need for say an IMM, you know, um, the, 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 um, 
the background declaration, the Schedule A. Um, and so clients have come back to me and they've said, oh, they're asking for this. Why? Well, we go back and look at their application that they filed. Okay, well, what did you answer here? What did you answer here? Ah, there's the problem, see? And in fact, I just did a review just yesterday with a client and we noticed it. They had four months of over, overlapping time where they said they were living one place and they were working in another. And then in another section, this client who paid me to do the full review had no clue they'd made this mistake, had moved and was transferred like our previous guy here with the intercompany transfer and wasn't sure how to list it because they were working in the same job for the same employer just in two different countries. So they just listed it all as Canada. Well, that's a misrepresentation that could have led to them getting a five-year bar. So some people may think, oh, give me a break. Why would I want to pay Mark $2,500 to review my application? Well, it's obviously your call, but everybody misses things, even the best of the best. You know, we're not perfect. And sometimes those small little slip-ups can mean the difference between you immigrating now or maybe being delayed two or three months or worse, never being able to immigrate again because you've got one year older, you've lost five points, and you no longer meet the minimum round of invitation level. Maybe you've dropped to 438. And we know back in December, 439 was the level that it actually dropped down to. That was the lowest. Okay, good question. All right, um, I'm going to end right there. And I know a lot of people have a lot of questions and I never seem to able, be able to get to all of them. But it was a really good EE Live Q&A today. I'm, I think it was because I wore my suit coat today you know, to look more professional. One of these days, I think I'm going to put my t-shirt on and have some fancy saying on the front. Guys, it's all substance here. The form, in other words, the presentation, how well it sounds. Sometimes my sound audio levels are off. I checked it today and it sounded like it was pretty good. But there's 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 no perfect way of presenting this. And, and sometimes it doesn't always come off as well as I'd like. But one thing I know is that the content is good. Otherwise, people wouldn't actually watch. Um, now I'm experimenting with some other things and I'm questioning whether it's wise to keep doing these long EE Live Q&As because they're just not as easily consumable in bite-sized pieces. That's why I try to timestamp them. But at this stage, this is how I like it. I love interacting with you guys. I love doing it right off the cuff where people can see that this isn't me going back and researching to figure out the answer. Like, I know this stuff. Uh, do not claim to be perfect. There are things that I don't have answers for. They're becoming fewer and fewer over the years, but every once in a while, there'll be a new question that I won't have an answer to. So I want to express a sincere appreciation to all of you guys for tuning in again. I want to remind everybody that this is ho this, this right here is sponsored by the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -Step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And all you need to do to access that is to go to, I'll be honest, it's pretty simple. If you're wondering, how do I access this? If you're watching this live on our Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, then go to the banner image right here, click on it. When you click on it, it pulls up the links. And then you can click on here. And if you're watching this video and you send me, Mark Holthy, an email, I will give you a code where you can enroll in the course and get right here by putting in the code, if I click enroll, by putting in the code, I'll, you can get half off this $497. So only for people who actually watch these videos. So all you have to do to access that, you can send me a message if you want on Messenger. You YouTubers can send it to mholthy at stringham.ca and tell me you watched the video and you want the coupon code and I'll give you 50% off. All right, you guys are the reason that these videos are even possible. If I was sitting here talking to myself, it would be pretty hilarious. Well, it would be pretty dry and pretty boring too. So it's the interaction with all you guys that makes it so much fun. All right, thanks so much for tuning in. I wanna wish all you guys, actually, do you know what? I wanna show you one other last thing that you guys don't know. And, and many of you are unaware of it, especially you YouTubers. In addition to my uh, Canadian Immigration Institute, I have the Canadian um, Immigration Podcast. And this is another thing that I'm also doing in conjunction with this that many of you don't even know about. It's on iTunes and, um, and I cover a whole host of different topics on immigration. So something else to tune in and check out. And I just wanted to share that with you guys before I wrap up this video. So now officially, finally, if you want to have your questions 
uh, answered here live. Um, join me on the Express Entry Law private Facebook group. Request to join. If you just want to send in a question and have an answer to then watch it later, then you can just send it right here to mholthy at stringham.ca and put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. All right, there we have it, guys. We're wrapping up. I'll stick these ones back here where they belong. And I will end this by wishing all of you guys the very best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry. Take care and see you later.